right, folks. Here we are for another uh, fiddle jam session. Um, I'm actually pre-recorded on this one uh, due to circumstances in my life. I'm not going to be home with my studio tonight, and I've got a borrowed fiddle. Um, it's not a very good one, but uh, that's all right. Some kind of Czech instrument, I think. Czechoslovakia. Student model. Anyways, um, I had an idea that I'd do A blues. We're going to A blues today. Now, in the usual Orsch method, um, I'll have something for everyone to try to, at beginning and to advance. And even the beginning stuff, maybe uh, the advanced people can, can glom onto that and learn some things. Maybe if you're a teacher, you can learn how to teach it better. But I thought about A blues today. It's such a cool scale, one of the favorite scales on the violin, because it has, count them, two easy zones. If you're not familiar with my materials, easy zones are a symmetrical fingering on two adjacent strings. Two strings right next to each other, the same fingering. It's like a fingering box set. And some scales lay very nicely and easily on the violin like that. And my Fiddle Jam book, uh, the Tail Leonard Corporation, is all about that. Uh, it's, it's like entry-level improv. If you've never improvised before, it's how to get your feet wet uh, with cool backing tracks and that kind of stuff. I don't have any backing tracks today. So we're going to focus on call and answer and me blabbing a bit. Um, so A blues, like I said, has two easy zones. It's it's a, it's a weird anomaly on the violin in standard tuning. Um, and on the top two strings, the A and E strings, it's open, low two, three, open, low two. You try that. Try it with me. Open, low two, three. So if you're new to violin, that's a, a spaced fingering there. And then the same exact thing on the E string. And that third finger should, if it's in tune, should match the open A. Like play them together. Do the loft. Yeah. So the, feel free about sliding it around, moving it around. We're going to work with some slides and, and pushes and things today. So, um, that's the top easy zone. It's nice uh, harmonically or in the key because it starts on the open string and that's the name of the key, that's the tonic note, that's the resting note. And uh, there is, so let's, let's put this in your head. This is A's, C's, D's, E's, G's, another A. A, C, D, E, G, A. C, D, E, G, A. A, C, D, E, G, A. A, C, D, E, J. A, C, D, E, G, A. Um, get that stuck in your head. Now, we're going to use the same exact letter names on the lower two strings, and there's also another easy zone down there. It, now, of course, we can't start an A necessarily because it's open G. But G was one of the notes. First finger A. Third finger C. Open D. First finger E, third finger G. So it's still A, C, D, E, G, but there's extra G down there. If you notice, that's open one, three, open one, three, and the bottom two strings. Except for you're playing musical ideas, you come back to the A to have your finishing note, your starting note, your most popular note, most used note, the tonic. So we have two easy zones. All the way across the violin, the first position for all kinds of coolness factor. All right. Now, as if you've listened to things with me before, um, we can add the blue note, the flatted fifth, in there as well. In the in the book, it's it's a gray note, and the stuff online on, on the Fiddle Jam Institute website, it's a blue note. Actually, it's colored blue. Uh, they wouldn't let me do color in the in the Hell Leonard book, but. Um, so, A, C, D, E, and E flat is the flatted fifth. It's the devil's tone, I'm going to call it. Adds coolness to it right away, doesn't it? It makes you curl up your lip. A lot of times it'll slide. So try that, sliding from E flat to E. And try it both directions of the bow. Down bow, sliding up, and up bow, sliding up. So you don't just go, little brain teaser, left and right brain stuff. Slide up both times with a down bow and slide up. Replace your finger and slide up with an up bow. 
Do that a bunch of times if that's foreign to you until your brain kind of connects there, and it will. You can slide down. Theoretically, you should practice both directions of the bow on that as well. And start messing around with those notes right away. Or either way. Now there's another E flat, as you may know, up on the A string. So the fifth of the of the key A B C D E E is is the five fifth note. Fifth is the most important uh, secondary note in a key, um, and it's open E. So how do you flat that? If you knew the violin, you can't retune your violin, you know, real quick. So you put the E uh, E E on the on the A string and flat it below fourth finger. falling off this violin because I'm not used to the spacing. Anyways, so there you got your two blue notes, your E flat. So we have the open one, three in the bottom, two strings, with the low one added on the D string for a good effect. Of your and we got open low two, three on the top two strings with that E flat low four. Already sounding cool, isn't it? You messing around with me? I hope so. So let's see what we can make of this. I mentioned some slides. We got some slides already. We got some pushes. It maybe it might happen in the bow. We haven't talked much about the bow in these live sessions. Um, but the bow is the, is the business end of things. This, especially this end, right? How you uh, do this stuff um, is important to bringing the violin alive. So it just doesn't sound sterile. So one way is to put a backbeat in it. If you're a uh, old time fiddler, they do that kind of stuff all the time. I'm not a great old time fiddler, but you can push on the backbeats. It gives it almost like in rock and roll, it's a drum. One, two, three, four, one, two, it's a snare drum, right? So we can kind of be the snare drum in our bow too, just by giving it shoves in the backbeat. It helps it be more danceable. So let's try some ideas. Copy me, the old call and answer thing. You. That's low two. You hear the pushes? Try it again. Push, push. So we're pushing mid stroke. That's low four. Even if I'm stroking separate, we can go uh, 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 on the two. Push. Copy me. That one's worthy of doing a few times. Copy me and play along with me. Did you see how I slid into that E flat? Subtle little things can bring your playing alive. Remembering that not all notes are supposed to be the same volume. That's three, low two, open on the E string. Go. Add some pushes. Now, of course, we can we can slide out of first position. There is a C right above that. Where your fourth finger would be, it's pushing half step further. Try that. You slide and come back. The hard part is getting back to the first position comfortably, but if you're loose-handed, you can even slide out of it. If you're comfortable with it, I am a fan of second position for this. That's four. Second where the third normally is. 
first where the second used to be, open. Try it. With me. How about this? You getting it? Is some common rock and roll riffs. Now, a lot of this stuff will come from the guitar world. So, now if you're a teacher, um, how do you incorporate this stuff into your classroom? Well, you can do it in, if you're a private teacher, you can have a, a, a warm up session. You can do just like I'm doing right here. You can pick some riffs. You could, if you're not, don't have the vocabulary, you can always buy my other book, The Rock and Blues Fiddle Jam Etudes. It's one measure, licks and tricks, and a, a, a whole bunch of keys. You can play a measure, have your kids try and play it back to you. Um, train their ears. You're also training your own vocabulary so you're staying a step ahead of them. If you're a school teacher, you can do the same thing with the whole orchestra. You can say, okay, you can have a, be cognizant of, of all the instruments and the ranges, but um, you can play something a a a a a a a a a u da 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 just like I'm doing here, right? Da 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 there's many benefits to doing that in an orchestra setting, in a classroom setting, because not only are they training their ears, but they're feeling ensemble. They're feeling the rhythm together, which is where your pieces and your, your ensemble playing your, your, is going to be more together. You're training their ears to listen to each other and feel a common beat. So uh, by doing these simple exercises, even just as a cool warm-up, especially if they're doing the blues scale and some blue notes and it sounds kind of hip, they're gonna love you, and they're gonna love it, and they're gonna like coming to your class. Even if they gotta work on stuff they might not even like, it'd be as, it think they're as hip. If they gotta work on the classical stuff and some kids don't like it, uh, at least you're being, doing some cool stuff, and maybe you can incorporate a cool song. So, I have uh, also, and to keep pitching my own wares, but I, I have quite a few arrangements for um, school string orchestras too, that are I think are hip. And different levels of playing. I haven't put those in the store lately. I'll have to look those up. But uh, I have them available if you want. Hit me up and I'll, I'll get you in touch with that stuff. Uh, so the kids can play something that's not classical but still challenging and still cool. So what do you think of the A Blues so far? You. Accents. polyrhythm with that one. <laughs> All kinds of cool stuff to be had in a minor pentatonic or a blues. So now blues is a weird anomaly in that um, some classical teachers have warned me about this, that teaching people, kids, the blues scale will freak their ears out, especially if they're Suzuki trained and they're used to the scale fitting the key. In blues, you may or may not be aware, I don't have a backing track today, but the blues is usually major chords. There's a, there's a minor blues too, but most of the time it's major chords, but the scale over the top of it is minor. So it's kind of freaky. Uh, I do have a keyboard right here. Here's an A. A major chord, but we're going. Over the. So we got. But somehow human beings think that that particular clash, the flatted third against the major third, or the minor third against the major third, is kind of cool. All right? Other clashes, not so cool. Flat two or something, that's so cool. But the flat third and major, that's kind of cool to us. The same thing with the flat of fifths. Here, flat fifth. 
those two clashes are, are cool to us. So um, you got to get used to that too. If the blues uh, chords, the one, four, five, as we've talked about in other sessions, the, the A, D, and E chords, all right, you're playing over them. This scale kind of bangs and clashes against it, but it's still kind of cool. So get used to that, um, and you can even bend between them a little bit. So, see, I'm sliding from low two to sort of high two. There's quarter tones in there. It's so now it's a classically trained. It probably sounds out of tune, but it's still. So the flat third, you can kind of slide if you're more of a. This is stuff that can't be written, which I think is totally cool. And uh, that might be the ticket for you to get your kids interested, like they're breaking the rules. Yes, this is how stuff works, but there's stuff that we can't exactly explain, and there's stuff that we can't exactly write, and there's stuff that can't be quantified, and that is so hip and so cool sounding that reaches into our souls, and it makes you a renegade rebel, and you're fiddle jamming. All right, so I hope that gives, gives you some ideas about a blues scale across the first position and stretching beyond a little bit, and some ideas to work with students, and some ideas to, to incre increase your own vocabulary of ideas, um, and that minor scales can fit over major chords, too. It's kind of weird, I know, but it, it's we like it as humans. Why? I don't know. It's one of the questions I'm saving for Answerland after I, Answerland after I die. But um, maybe before that, if I can tap into it, right? And tapping in is what it's all about. So never overthink this stuff. Don't think too hard. Just try and hear what you'd like to play is always the rule in my in, from, from my standpoint. Try and hear what you'd like to play and just play that on purpose with gusto. All right? Play it on purpose. So even if it's something dumb, stupid, corny, and simple, it's yours. Play it and own it. All right? That's always the thing. And if, as a teacher, you can give uh, your students the opportunity to do that without criticism, that's a big deal too. Don't criticize their improvisation. You'll dwarf them for life about being creative. Now, you can, you can critique their Vivaldi and Mozart, but you can't critique uh, their improvisation or creativity. That's a no-no. Uh, we want to ex always frame it in some kind of positive, let me hear more of that, or you could do more of this, maybe. Let me hear more accents, or... I think what you're doing is great. So I always want to phrase it positively so they don't get uh, dented and scarred and scared to be creative. That's anti-creative, all right? So you have to be free. Um, Friddle Jam Freedom Formula is what we're pushing here. And if you have any questions, you give me a call or email me or comment down below. I'm happy to do more. And come to the Fiddle Jam Institute. There are sales in the store about different courses I have. Um, you can join as an All Access Pass member and... and um, for a nominal fee monthly. You can join the free Fiddle Jam Club and be on our newsletter and get some freebies on the site as well. Uh, FiddleJamInstitute.com, check it out, and I'll see you there.